This week in the Enterprise Security News, we'll discuss how Threat Connect integrates the Microsoft Graph Security API to strengthen security automation. Sectigo unveils Sectigo Quantum Labs to help organizations prepare for quantum computers. Trend Micro offers comprehensive network and endpoint protection for IoT and 5G private networks. Thycotic is releasing Identity Bridge and so much more. In our second segment, we've got two pre recorded interviews from Security Weekly Virtual Hacker Summer Camp. Chris Morales from Vectra and Anton Chuvakin from Google Cloud and Matt Hastings from Tanium. Uh, and uh, the second one was together. So Anton uh, and uh, the folks from Tanium did. That's a great one. Uh, they're all great, but that one was a lot of fun as well. Um, then two more from Security Weekly Virtual Hacker Summer Camp. Uh, Dan DeClos from PlexTrack and Gabe Gums from Spirion. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Today, every business is a digital business. Most of us are migrating workloads to the cloud, adopting DevOps tools, rolling out RPA software, and supporting a remote workforce. While opportunity is great, so is the risk of advanced cyber attacks. Many high-profile breaches start with a compromise of privileged credentials. CyberArk is the number one leader in privileged access management. Talk to CyberArk today to secure privileged access for humans and machines across hybrid and cloud environments and on endpoints. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash CyberArk and stay one step ahead of the attackers. Detecting and responding to threats in the cloud is harder than doing it on-prem. Even when you do have the visibility you need, legacy security workflows weren't designed for the speed and complexity of cloud environments. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to spot threats across the hybrid attack surface, provide detailed investigation steps, and help you automate response. Request your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome to episode 195 of Enterprise Security Weekly for August 19th, 2020. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined remotely by Mr. John Strand. John, welcome. Thank you for having me back. I'm just glad to be here. Like we were talking about, things have been kind of insane for a lot of us the past few weeks, especially with Hacker Summer Camp kind of not happening. Right. But uh, happy to be here today. And I love your set in the background. It looks nice. You guys did a nice job with that. I, I had I had a bar I had to reach, Paul. Yeah. I don't know if you know color of blue. I call this Security Weekly Blue. I love it. I love the color. I was actually thinking I really like that color blue. It's nice. <laughs> Mr. Matt Alderman is here with us. Matt, welcome. Yeah, no blue walls. I think Lauren might get a little angry with me if I painted that wall blue. But, you know, it's it's good to have John back. You know, Virtual Hacker Summer Camp did kind of happen for us yes, anyways. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I think the right answer, Matt, to the color is yes, dear. <laughs> I think right. we all know that all too well, right? Yes, dear. Uh, let's see. couple of announcements. Join the Security Weekly mailing list for webcast and virtual training announcements and receive an invite to our Discord server by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. You can join our list as well as subscribe to all of the shows on the Security Weekly network. If you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on the shows, submit your guest suggestion by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guest, complete that form, and we will review them on a regular basis. Sometimes that gets derailed, but uh, in any case. And it's always your fault. Just it is always my it, fault. It's, it's You're at home with the kids on Fridays when Shannon's working, and that's usually when we skip that meeting. It's the, the COVID-19 work schedule is what is what, what happens. So, all righty. Let's dig into the news. Uh, our segments after this are pre-recorded, and we'll give you a little rundown at the end of this segment as to uh, what's coming up. So make sure you stay tuned. Uh, where do you guys want to start? Let's start with the threat intel stuff. Yes. That's big. That was Threat Connect integrates with the Microsoft Graph Security API. Are you familiar with this API, John? I haven't used it that much. I know we've had customers that have, um, but honestly, just haven't seen it enough to actually develop an opinion one way or the other yet. Mm. 
Yeah, it looks like it's it, it's an integrated API to get you to Azure Sentinel, O365, Microsoft Defender ATP. So it looks like a really great integration point to get access to a number of the, the Microsoft capabilities. And by integrating your threat intel and some of your automation orchestration activities there, it looks like a way. But what I don't know, John, is what's missing. What can't I get access I, to? I, I can this? tell you what's missing from this article. Like the big thing that's missing that they either neglected to talk about or they don't have is they didn't mention Microsoft Sentinel um, on the SIM because Microsoft is pushing a lot of their customers to try to tie together a lot of their event notifications, especially in the cloud, up to Sentinel. And I know that a couple of Fortune 5s are using Sentinel with advanced threat protection and have amazing luck with it. It's very, very, very fast to query. So the fact that that isn't mentioned here, I really hope is just an oversight. Um, oh, wait, no, there it is. It's right. It's the first bullet point. Never mind. Um, but yeah, that's actually pretty huge because with the ability to correlate all the different logs that are coming together from multiple different endpoints and from Azure, tying that into Sentinel and being able to hook your threat intelligence feed into the middle of that is going to be just absolutely monstrous for organizations to be successful for their endpoint SIM analytics. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to tie those external uh, threat intelligence with your actual internal threat intelligence, which we've always touted as the right strategy. Yes, yes. Um, and, so and it looks like the ability to have some actionability out of it with the integration of the Threat Connect SOAR platform, because that's going to be the other piece. Once mm -hmm. I have all that contextual data pulled together and I can really identify what's going on, now the ability to potentially take some action out of there looks like the other piece they're trying to provide here. Yeah, and that's been one of the things that we've been seeing a lot of customers try to focus on is developing runbooks um, as part of SOAR. So if you do have... So the idea that I think a lot of people are missing whenever you're looking into SOAR is this, this, this concept that you can automatically triage and deal with an incident. Attacker comes in, you stop the attacker. That's the holy grail. That's stupid. Don't do that. Uh, what works really, really well, however, is if you're actually implementing things like runbooks and automated runbooks. Um, I was just talking with Rob Fuller about this yesterday. The idea that instead of actually trying to isolate and contain Imagine if you have an indicator of a compromise, and then you can automatically pull down process information, network connection information, who's currently logged into that computer system. And then all of that stuff that you would normally do as the first phase of incident response for identification, that's what gets sent to the analyst. Mm. So instead of looking at it from the perspective of trying to stop it, you're enabling the analyst by giving them those first few steps to actually analyze that incident to come up with an idea of whether or not it is malicious and you're enabling them with the information that they need to make proper decisions moving forward. And I think that's where you're going to see that value of security orchestration and automation, not the full stop. I think that's what's gonna sell it to executives. But I think what's going to sell it to line security teams is reducing the amount of time it takes for an analyst to figure out what exactly is going on on those endpoints. And you system. definitely want that, right? Because you don't want the automation to be used against you. In other words, if someone's <laughs> password is spraying your accounts, oh, well, just lock those accounts out, right? Well, then as an attacker, yeah. I can lock everyone out of your AD just by doing password spraying. That's bad. Yep. Yep. That's bad. That's a bad day. <laughs> yes. We've seen that go wrong. I've been the victim of that, I think. Uh, been on both times. sides of that coin, actually. <laughs> right? Yep. Uh, let's see. What else is... Uh, there's a couple of uh, web app ones in here, too, Matt. Uh, well, there's also the, the article on getting the most out of threat intelligence ingestion, which is kind of on the same vein of, of the previous discussion. And when I read this initially, I was thinking wait, like Gravel does this and, and there's some other players that do this. So I wasn't quite sure kind of, you know, I don't know eclectic IQ, um, but I know there's other solutions out there doing very similar things from an ingestion standpoint. So did you guys read the dark reading article on threat intelligence that came out from uh, Robert Lemos? Uh, I might have missed that one. Okay. So the article talking about threat intelligence feeds, once again, this is John's soapbox. You know, anytime this comes up, John freaks out, all right? Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, a bunch of universities took a bunch of open source and commercial threat intelligence feeds, and they basically pulled them back in. And the Verizon Data Breach Report has done something similar over the past few years, and then checked for overlap across those different threat intelligence feeds. And the percentages are abysmal. 
uh, were vendor one and vendor two. They didn't actually list who the vendors were. They had 1.3% overlap between the two commercial threat intelligence feeds. Um, the other one going back the other direction was a 4% overlap. And then the open source ones were about 13% overlap. Um, this gets into a question. I think it's you ingest threat intelligence feeds, but how you actually ingest that and push it across your entire environment to develop those indicators of compromises and refine them far beyond IP addresses and hashes mm. is something I still feel like this industry just has not grappled with. And reading a lot of these articles, if you go back to the source of where this is coming from, I believe that the source is not as valuable as people think it is. So it's interesting that we're talking about ingesting and moving these things around whenever we still haven't gotten to answering the core question of what is the value of the threat and tell feeds that are actually coming into an organization. And we yeah, really, and it, as, as an organization, need to look at that. Go ahead. And how many do you need? You just pointed out, when is enough enough? If the overlap is at max 13%, that means I need, what, like All of them. six or seven <laughs> of these at least to, to and, get and that to coverage? Sure that I mean... There are companies that that's what they sell, is they basically say, we take all the threat intelligence feeds, we deconflict all the threat intelligence feeds, and then you come up with a super threat intelligence feed. Mm. How the hell is that an answer to this problem, that you just have to spend more money on these threat intelligence feeds? Um, I, 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 like I said, this I know why this sells. I know why people buy it from a psychological perspective. But actually seeing a threat intel feed stop us in our attacks, it almost never happens. Mm. And if you're looking at any advanced adversary, their tactics are going to change. And I, I, I think it's interesting they're talking about how to push this and integrate it with the overall stack in your infrastructure. And that needs to be done. But I think it comes from fruits of a poisonous tree. If you can't trust the intel that's coming in to be effective in stopping current attacks, what is the value of that threat intel feed? Now, some threat intel vendors will actually get into full tactics, procedures, all of those different things. You know, the, the pyramid of pain but the vast majority of the data you get out of threat intel feeds are still IP address and file hashes. Yeah, actually, the, the interview we did last week uh, or aired last week with uh, Reversing Labs um, talked about doing just that, John, is there, you know, they're providing the tactics and, and techniques and integrating that so you can take automated actions on those, not just well, the kind of like tip of the spear, IP address, yeah. domain import kind of thing. Yeah. Like they actually break down the data and they I know they do a good job because I've seen uh, their data before it was integrated well, right with, with a product it, when I was at Tenable just to be you know, fully transparent and I was like this is awesome it tells me everything that this particular malware was doing and now he's made that so you can uh, normalize it and and uh, take action on it well and that gets into the bass space right and whenever you're looking at adversarial simulation or mm -hmm. emulation because there's an argument over those two words I guess hmm. um, Whenever an attacker gets on your network, they're going to use the same types of techniques and different combinations. And I think that's where threat intelligence vendors are starting to focus their efforts. Yeah. They kind of play that MITRE attack bingo, and they should be playing MITRE attack bingo mm -hmm. and getting away from just IP addresses and hashes. Sorry, Matt, there was a, an article about Styra. I know you're familiar with them, right? Styra. Styra, yeah. did yeah, I say that right? They, this is the first I've heard of them. Styra. Yeah, well, they they are behind the open policy agent originally, right? So this is the commercial version of the open source project known as open policy agent. And what they're trying to do is enable uh, different authorization uh, policies across different architectures using OPA. Now, what's interesting about this article was the compliance aspects of this and how they're going to change the way they do their updates and support, which I, it, it, this one puzzled me just a little bit because I'm like, all right, if there's a critical vulnerability that needs to be addressed, shouldn't I address it as soon as possible? But they basically said, look, we're going to do two releases a year. Every six months, we're going to put everything into it. But that six-month window could potentially open up some critical stuff. So I, I get it that in a compliant environment, maybe you don't want to change stuff too often because you don't want to revalidate. But if there's something critical, wouldn't you want it faster? That was the only thing I couldn't understand out of this mm. article. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah. Um, uh, are we are going to talk about quantum computing a little bit? Oh, it... dude, can we please talk about quantum computing? So uh, Sectigo is unveiling uh, Sectigo Quantum Labs to help organizations prepare for quantum computers. Apparently so they're about like 10 to 15 years ahead of their time? 
I mean, <laughs> that's great. Always be prepared, I guess. Well, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that sweet, sweet blockchain money is dried up. So you got to move to something else. It's true. It is kind of similar in the bleeding edge technology realm, right? But I, just, it is. But let's, yeah. But, but but let's talk about this because. Look, we, we talk about this as being snake oil, and I honestly believe that whatever they're selling is snake oil. And I know that they can get mad at me and they can argue with it. But I agree with what Matt just said. They're, they're five to ten years ahead of whatever this is going to be. And um, two things on that. One, quantum computing is real. Like, that is a thing without question. If you look at what D-Wave has been doing in conjunction with Google, it's, it's happening, right? Yeah. This yeah, is and, uh, not... and Amazon uh, AWS had oh. an announcement about quantum computing this week, too. And Absolutely. IBM's been pushing on this front. Mm -hmm. Yep. But what I think most people don't understand about quantum computing is whenever you create a quantum computer, it is not a general purpose computer. There's this belief that you can have your Mac or your Windows system all of a sudden be, it has qubit processors and it's now infinitely faster. That's not true. So when you're looking at quantum computers as they exist, they're not general purpose computers. They're usually doing very specific types of functions. Mm. So you would need to create a quantum computer for a very specific type of attack. And one of the things they talk about this, to be completely honest, is they are talking in the right way about talking about different types of algorithms and how those algorithms are going to be obsolete very quickly with quantum computing. Mm -hmm. And that's true. But... To say that they're going to develop a security team and, and product offerings right now to protect organizations is dubious at best. And they're, they're basically protecting against this nebulous, non-existent threat that doesn't exist yet. And that's why I think it's snake oil at this phase. Now, five to 10 years down the road, absolutely, it's going to be something that we have to talk about. But right now, you're not talking about a quantum computer that's general purpose that you can just attack networks with at the moment. And, and I think the, the, the main point here is that we know the encryption algorithms will get compromised and we'll have to come up with new ones. The problem is no one's really figured out on the research side what are those new algorithms. So what am I going to put in this lab to build new right. solutions for? I mean, they are this working. This is still evolving. Yeah, they are working on it. And they're not just laying silent. We've done interviews right. maybe last year, right? And there is obviously active work to get new uh, cryptographic standards to be more resilient. Uh, and that work's happening. But, I mean, there's really kind of very little action you need to take today. Uh, yes. Maybe the next three years, you might want to start start planning for it, right? And then, John, I think you know, five to ten years is when stuff will really go down. Now, if it comes back to the point where they're looking at their customer base is specifically going to be like DoD IC, then and and we'd have to go to their website and look at it. Then, without question, this is actually something that isn't necessarily a product that every single company needs to have. But if we're looking at who your customers are, without yeah. question, it's going to be DOD and IC. Because I can totally see the Russians or the Chinese or the NSA developing quantum computers to attack these types of things. But right, right. now, I know of no nation state that is basically working on something to crack RSA yeah. yet. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, and that's, I think we talked about it last week briefly, right? But in Stuxnet, there was an MD5 hash collision for a I think it was a code signing cert in Microsoft, right? I mean, we don't often no, no, see that. No, that. that was Duke. No, that was Duke who? Uh, yeah, I, think I think you're right. Pronounced Duke, yeah. That was Duke. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because everyone assumed that the attackers had actually forced that collision when an easier answer to that is somebody gave someone a suitcase full of money to get the certificate out of Microsoft. Right. Um, but, but that's a whole other conversation. But I'm pretty sure it was Duke that right. had the Microsoft code signing certificate in it. But, I mean, we don't often see those attacks right at that at that level i mean they're more rare than your you know password spraying certainly which well, is probably you, what you, you should look at focus stuxnet, on but, but almost all of those were they stole the code signing certificate yeah so stuxnet stole it from Reltech and j micron yep. duke had one from microsoft um or was it flare god damn it i can't remember duke i think was stealing code signing certificates yeah Flame. and then legacy bit nine years ago the attackers stole the code signing right. certificate from bit nine so yeah Alrighty. Well, uh, where do we want to go next? Um, identity. Psychotic is releasing Identity Bridge. It sounds like they're uh, kind of entering in the space of being uh, a, a directory service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, similar to Jump Cloud and Centrify has a directory service. 
basically alternatives to Active Directory, AWS as a directory too, I believe, right? How do you win? I, I got a question for both of you. How, how the hell do you win? Uh, you unify across multiple platforms is the big thing, right? I mean, that's why when we cover Jump Cloud, I think we've, we're trying to schedule a meeting with them to learn more. Because I remember researching, I want a directory, but I want to be cross-platform. Because, I mean, essentially, we're a small shop here at Security Weekly, but we've got every single platform on the planet because we need them uh, for doing specific things. And I want to tie them all to a central directory. And I'm not quite big enough for AD. I guess if you're larger, maybe you don't want the attack surface that comes along with AD. My question, John, and I don't know if you or your team have looked into this, is when a customer is using an alternative directory service to Active Directory, what's the security implications of that? Is it worse? Is it better? Or is it just uncharted territory? It, it, it's it's generally worse. And, mm. and the reason why is if you're looking at kind of the legacy Active Directory stuff, as, as much as people like to say, ooh, that's old and stodgy, it's old and it's been around and it's been beat up by some of the best pen testing firms in right. the world. We understand it. Now, and, and to give you an idea, because a lot of these firms also support two-factor, mm -hmm. and some of the attack methodologies would be like a spear phishing attack where you can register as a different customer on the same platform, send your attack to the customer you're going through, and then basically leveraging that kind of, that, that kind of cross-customer single platform and using that attack methodology to gain access to environments. That's not for all of them, but the point is, a lot of these newer companies, they haven't been around as long and they mm. haven't been through as many attacks as Microsoft has been through. Right. Um, and even Ping, Ping's been around forever. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people are like, well, this is cooler and hotter than Ping or Duo or any of these different companies. But but seriously, they've been around a long time and there's a mm -hmm. lot of security value that comes from that aging. Right. But this is where you see the identity player starting to realize identity is broader than just privilege access or just a, a subcomponent of identity. And you know, I've been saying this for years, that the PAM market's going to have to realize that over time, identity and access management it is going to get integrated with, with privilege access as well. And I think what you start to see from some of these privilege access guys is adding capabilities to stay relevant in a world where identity and access capabilities are going to merge into more uh, centralized oh. platforms. And, and Matt, I think that's the answer of how you win. Because anybody that comes on to these shows and they say that they're going to do something and they're going to compete with Active Directory, you have to unseat Active Directory. And you're not going to unseat Active Directory in existing companies. But like Paul was talking about, small companies, startup companies, a lot of them have no interest in developing the skill set in the Active Directory space. So that's the market segment that you actually go for. And I think that that's a winning strategy because mm -hmm. you're not going to hit Active Directory head on and, and take right. it from Right, not in the enterprise. Yeah, it's, it's been entrenched for too long. Yep, it's like running head first into the buzzsaw. That's it. <laughs> Force Point is delivering Global Enterprise's new remote browser isolation solution powered by Ericom. I really do like the browser isolation solutions, though. Uh, and there's it, a, a lot of different ways to skin the cat. I do, I do like them because I feel like the browser is the operating system within the operating system in a ripe attack surface in so many different ways. The more you can isolate that, the better. The better. Um, one of the, and this is absolute truth, Paul, we've been saying on this show that the browser is a new endpoint. Mm -hmm. Your organization has to come to grips with that. Like now, the browser is the new endpoint. So you can do browser isolation. And I think that there's value in that. But who cares? And, and let me explain why. Traditionally, whenever you're trying to gain access to an environment, I'm trying to put malware on a workstation. But if the browser is the new endpoint, if I can convince somebody to insert, install a plugin, I could put it up on the Google Play Store you know, um, or Chrome Store very, very, very easily. As soon as I get into that browser, then I have access to your, your, your clipboard, I have access to your browsing history, I have mm -hmm. access to all your session identifiers, and I can steal all that. And I know this because at BHIS, We've created malware that does exactly that with the browser being the new endpoint. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy that you have companies that are starting to see where we're going to be in the next few years. And I think that they're looking in the right place. And I hope to see more of this because we still see far too many organizations focusing on the endpoint. Right. And it's interesting we this, did, uh, you, know, you talk about the, the browser as uh, an attack vector. When I did the interview with a researcher who presented at Black Hat, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, it will air on this show. He found several vulnerabilities in the JavaScript engines inside of all the browsers. 
Now, I had kind of like seen on the surface that yes, there's different browsers, they have different JavaScript engines. <clears throat> there's big differences between them, right? Each browser mm -hmm. platform has a different type of JavaScript engine. The one in Firefox, he said, was the most vulnerable. Chrome uses something different. Since Safari uses like a machine language compiled one, the one in Firefox was written in C, so it, it had some vulnerabilities. But, you know, John, back to your point, great. You don't even need a browser plugin, right? If I can use JavaScript code to exploit your JavaScript engine in your browser and break out of some of that isolation, uh, he was able to do some really interesting attacks. And I, and I think what's going to happen, I'm guessing what's going to happen with that is if you remember years ago when we were at Black Hat DEF CON, um, we had that party that was hosted by, uh, I think it was Adobe. And yes. I have this picture of me hugging the Adobe sign. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is the vulnerabilities that started coming out for Adobe were, they came fast and furious for a long time. And what you see in kind of the exploit dev circles is as soon as something is perceived to start having security issues, it kind of creates this this dinner bell for security yep. researchers, and they all pile onto it. And 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 I've heard about that JavaScript presentation as well. Mm. I think the dinner bell has been wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I like Authenticate's approach, Paul. When mm -hmm. we sat down with, with Matt from Authenticate, where the browser is not on your desktop, it's outside. Right. They're streaming a view back. That is that is complete browser isolation because. The attacks you just talked about are not applicable when that browser is running off the machine outside of the environment. That's why I like that solution. I'm not sure how this Aircom integration here with Forcepoint mm -hmm. does something similar. It looks like it's it, it's kind of like a sandbox kind of isolation thing versus I think what Authenticate's doing, which is just get the browser off, off the device the desktop, altogether. Yeah. I, I, I can't remember who the vendor is, but there was a vendor who basically you got a video stream of yes. a browser. Yes, so Authenticate. Who, who yeah. is that? Authenticate. Uh, the, the, the product is called Ensilo. The company is That's called it. Authentic Silo. with an 8. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And Ensilo was specifically created for savvy and T-savvy environments, trusted and below operability and trust, uh, top secret and below interoperability, because you literally could not have those packets going back and forth with browser interaction right. in a secure environment. And that's a really cool product and a super cool approach. Yeah, that is my favorite approach. It reminds me, I, I really want to license that for our, our staff. He's <laughs> he's setting up, he, no, yeah. he's, he, Matt Comes said he's going to set up demo accounts for yeah. us. Yeah, we need I'm to just do waiting that. for him to but, do it. But they're running an appliance. Like you can set up demo accounts and run through it, but it's an appliance, which is super cool. Yeah, and it's good for research too, right? I want to go to a site, but I <laughs> don't want to go to the site. So is that actually researchers are, are using the platform as well. Uh, yeah. Let's see what else we got in here. Uh, a couple of funding announcements. Uh, cybersecurity platform Keeper Security has raised $60 million. This sounds like a sore kind of, of approach or no keeper keeper's keeper is about password this is a oh password sorry that was the other one yeah, yeah the other one i was crossing yeah. my wires keeper is about this passwords is, yeah yeah this is a password vault right for business and for consumers there's a number of them out there um i, I think this is the one that insight ventures came in on i believe yeah so insight partners yep. came in on this one um mm. You know, there's other password vaults and managers out there. I mean, right. what like how do you differentiate these... yourself in that space, right? Like a exactly password vault, right. a password vault. Basically. I'm going to try to channel Matt and I'm going to do it incorrectly. I think that this is a purchase because there's a bunch of companies out there that have a gaping hole as far as password and identity management. And if they want to continue to play, they're going to have to have that in their portfolio. I think this is a company that's going to get bought at some point in the very near future. Mm. Probably true. Yeah, I just, I couldn't see the differentiation there. Now, Cyware is the was other one. one. Yeah. And, um, and this and was uh, one, Tanium and this Mercado huge, partners. Yeah. Yep. I, I think Cyware, I hate to say that anybody is lucky because of COVID, but I think Cyware just happens to be in the right place at the right time. Um, with the fact of everyone wrote, working re remotely and remote management integration with SOAR, um, the entire industry shifted in three months. And I think that they were in a good position. They are in a good position um, to actually take advantage of the situation that we're in right now. Yeah, because if you're doing all the capabilities they're doing in the cloud and don't have to have all this stuff on prem, because how many of these SOC teams are, are on prem, right? So to your point, John, they were in a really good position. 
providing some of these capabilities more in a remote uh, style. And, and I can just imagine at Cyware, just talking about this, like how many times, Paul, have we talked to companies that are like, oh, I don't want to put anything in the cloud. The cloud is just someone else's computer. And no, we're not going to do this. And then literally within 60 days, almost every single company out there is like, we don't want an on-prem solution. We want this in the cloud. We want to have centralized management across absolutely everything. And it happened like that. Mm -hmm. We've been predicting it for a long time, John. It's just, you needed another, we needed another catalyst to accelerate it. Right. COVID accelerated it overnight. Because we also said we yep. didn't, we didn't want endpoint agents, but obviously, you know, that ship sailed because if everyone's working well, remotely, that's what you got. But, but has it? I mean, it, it, once again, going back to Microsoft, uh, you know, I keep hitting this. Like, advanced threat protection is solid endpoint protection. Mm -hmm. It will go, it will go toe to toe with Silence and CrowdStrike. Um, it absolutely will. But now with Microsoft, you, it, it's funny because whenever people install Defender or something like that, they don't consider that to be another agent. They consider right. it to already be on the system. But it is so that'd be like another really agent. Hard <laughs> yeah. Placement. Like, yeah. I think Microsoft just suffers from uh, having a lot of solutions and being difficult to navigate. I think if they can oh, create a clear... In, yeah, then they shoot... Exactly, John. They're shooting themselves in the foot. I think their technology is awesome. I think you're right. They can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with many of the vendors on the market today. Uh, and they just need to do a better job of educating, basically. Um, yep. I did well, want to talk about goobies. this... The remote management GUIs are train wrecks. Yeah. Like, if you look at Silence, you look at CrowdStrike, you look at Sentinel-1, you look at Endgame... Those GUIs and those interfaces are intuitive. They're slick. Right. They reduce the amount of time that you have to spend researching. They're mm -hmm. amazing. Microsoft is like, this looks like an MMC snap-in. Yeah. God damn it. Uh, Trend Micro has interesting, um, so comprehensive network and endpoint protection for IoT and 5G private networks. Their endpoint protection for IoT devices uh, can be a physical SIM card and software Java applet. Uh, it includes... Device white uh, listing, geofencing, firmware integrity, IMZ, IMEI lockdown, zero touch provisioning, authentication, on demand TLS key generation. Like, I kind of like read that, like, what are you going to put on a IoT device to right. help secure it? And I'm like, well, obviously they thought this through. That's actually sounds pretty, <laughs> actually sounds pretty cool. Yeah. But, but how many of these have a physical SIM card slot on mm -hmm. them to enforce this? Or do I want to take a Java applet and put it on my IoT device? Really? Right. right. Do you? I don't. Well, well I mean, certainly we can Java. go back. I mean, the Israeli <laughs> water plant, which I keep picking on as an attack, but in this case, it's relevant because those were IoT devices that did have 4G and had SIM yep. cards in them. They were used for remote access. So, I mean, that does happen. But, I mean, the vast majority of IoT devices don't. So... And this and is so much point. larger than I think most people in the industry know. Like if you're looking at fleet management for trucks, if you're looking at yes. asset management, if you're looking at oil refineries, you're looking at this, like almost all of these companies uh, from a leapfrog technology, they don't put their IoT devices like on the standard internet with a Cat5 cable and they plug it in. They jumped and they went straight to 4G yep. and 5G. And this is a huge market segment, and it's mm -hmm. just going to get bigger. In fact, I've, I've been talking to some of the 5G network providers because you ride on top of AT&T or Verizon, but then there's also providers that sell that internet access kind of like, like as a reseller. And they're spending a lot of time talking about enterprises that are actually looking at their new internal network is nothing but an IPv6 network where all of your systems are actually connected to that 5 or 4G network and that becomes your enterprise network behind their protection on the internet. This is huge. Um, and I look at this as something where a lot of companies are moving very, very, very quickly, and it's quiet. I don't see a lot of people talking about it as much as they should be. Well, it's interesting. You put an IoT device on your home network, like it doesn't need to be connected to my network. It talks no. maybe wirelessly via uh, Zigbee and oh. Z-Wave to my stuff, right? And then it needs to talk so, up to the cloud, and my app goes to the cloud. Why does it even need to be on my network? It's a great point. It actually, doesn't. John. And, yeah. and like I have dog collars, right? They're mm -hmm. geofencing dog collars where I can track where my dogs are and I can send static correction and do all this stuff. They all have SIM cards. They're basically yep. cell technology, and I'm tracking yeah. all of that stuff. And that's just a sliver of what's to come. I need those for my kids. It, <laughs> right. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Right. Actually, but if you here, think about on. the, he's gonna go get one. He's gonna go get. But if you think a, about a dog or a kid, the world we're in or the world we're moving to, 
why not just use 5G communication yeah. for all your remote employees on IPv6, which means it's not even a scannable mm -hmm. uh, interface, as long as Bingo. you're not bridging to IPv4, right. holy cow, that changes the entire remote workforce network overnight. Well, like Todd from Beers from Rapid7 said, so like, you could have a whole internet on IPv6 that no one would really know about because it'd touch. be so hard to find, right? <laughs> So this is, um, so I bought some dog collars, uh, spot on dog collars, like I told you. And one of the things that made me mad about them was they were expensive and their clip for actually staying on the dog wasn't very good and it mm -hmm. fell off. Mm -hmm. So I went and bought this. This is just a kid's phone uh, watch, right? And it's a hundred bucks and I can do full geolocation. I can call it directly. Mm -hmm. um, it runs on the 4G network. We're talking about technology that's a hundred dollars. Yep. So... This is, you know, I, I think that this is probably that revolutionary type thing. And I'm basically going to make this into a dog collar. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just so cheap. It's so easy to work with. And the security implications are staggering. So you'd use a physical SIM card in that particular case to protect it yeah. potentially. I don't yeah, think you're going to install right, a Java applet on it, but yeah. It goes right here. I don't know if I can install a Java applet <laughs> on it. But a lot of these companies, they'll actually send you the SIM card for their network. So mm -hmm. what Trent is doing, I think is they're actually trying to put some level of security on those SIM cards directly. Um, we do have uh, a couple of announcements as we transition into our next segment. Uh, technical training is happening here on the Security Weekly Network on August 27th. If you want to learn about Boothole, SIGRED, and SMB Bleed, uh, make sure you go register for that on securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. Um, how to protect uh, your home network on September 10th. Uh, again, securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts or slash on demand for the archive. Uh, coming up, we've got um, a couple of interviews, right? We've got uh, Chris Morales from Vectra. That was his name. Matt Hastings and Anton uh, from Google Cloud. That was very interesting integration between Chronicle and Tanium, uh, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, what do we have? Plex track, aggregating all your pen tests uh, and vulnerability data. And then I think, did I do, Gabe? Ah, I did the Gabe Gums one uh, with Sperion. Yeah. Talk about, you know, privacy and how it relates to security uh, and data protection uh, and some interesting trends in that area. So all of those interviews coming up next. Next. 